became a racial caste system because before I read the book I had never thought of it like that and it, it really gave you no room for doubt that that was the case. That's what Michelle, that's the beauty of what Michelle Alexander did. She took a lot of things that folks in the black community have been saying for a long time, a lot of historical facts, a lot of reality and she wove it into a tapestry that people could understand and identify with and see that it's real. And that's what we try to do in our work. We try to present the reality of mass incarceration, uh, social, social injustice, what's really happening in America, so that people can see it. And what we find is that when people of good heart see the truth, then it opens their mind up and it begins to move. And they can say, yes, you know, this is wrong, and what can we do to change this? And just because you're young doesn't preclude you being a part of that movie. Has anybody seen the movie uh, Selma yet? Okay. So what do you think of that? I thought it was pretty cool. I didn't really know much about Selma before. So I think it was interesting to like see that. Part of that I didn't really know about before. What do you think of that first scene when the little girls got blown up? What was the first scene? <laughs> you were talking girls got blown up. Oh yeah, that was, it was like I don't know, just like crazy. Yeah, I thought. Back. Yeah, well, what do you think about it? Um, Any the parts that especially struck you as? Well, I thought the whole movie was really powerful. Um, I thought the first time that they went over the bridge and there was that line of um, police standing there, that I thought was, and they realized that it wasn't going to be as easy as just walking over the bridge. Um, that, I think, was one of the most powerful moments of the movie, I thought. Yes, sir. Yes. Just when, um, just the whole premise that, like, it doesn't matter until they get on TV and how... Um, and kind of Martin Luther King talking about 
um, the difference between him and Malcolm X is that Malcolm X um, really helped form like black consciousness, and he and Martin Luther King was really good at forming white consciousness. So like, um, so like Malcolm X was really good at like um, riling up African Americans and like getting them really involved in the cause, but Martin Luther King was particularly good at messaging to white people to get the masses involved and to get the TV cameras down there and to like really try and affect change to get Lyndon Johnson to see to see it and um and I and yeah that that was what it was growing. Um I thought it was interesting and when they were at one point they're like meeting in the church and they asked like is this governor or is Sheriff, is he a da 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 or a da da da? And is he a da or is he reasonable? Yeah. Or is he Bulkan. smart? Yeah, yeah. bull con. And he said he's a bull con. Yeah. And the guy says, like, Bulkan. bingo. And, um, and I think it's, at first I was struck, like, they're like, why do they want, like, well, why do they want that so that they want, so that they get publicity about that? And then I was, but then I was also struck. And they'll give me a job or guys have skills. Many times, male and females, while they are incarcerated, they develop skills. And they work in, in the kitchen, they work on, they work on um, the construction, in the electric shop, in the plumbing shop, and they develop those skills that can be transferred to the street. So it's extremely important for those who are incarcerated to begin the process of transformation while you are inside. And many folks do it in different ways. Some do it spiritually. You know, they become good Christians, they become Muslims. You know, I became a Rastafarian. Because for the first time in a lot of our lives, we have the time to think, to contemplate, to look inside of ourselves and say, who am I really? And that's something that a lot of us don't do when you're born, and when you're making thousands of dollars a week. You have the finest girls and the nicest cars, and you got a crew that is moving to the city, and it's like Hollywood. And that's why people do cry. I grew up as one of those witnesses, you know, um, in a suburban, nice community, with trees, nice lawns. I wasn't one of the guys who circumstances forced to become a criminal. And I met a lot of guys like that. I met guys who, from the time they were like six, seven, eight years old, were running drugs on the corner just to feed their brothers and sisters. Because their mother was addicted and their father was born. So a lot of times, crime is situational, caused by the opportunity, or, or caused by the situation and the circumstance. But many times, people choose to go into criminal behavior simply because it's a lucrative lifestyle, and in the black urban areas, this is how you grow up. And the guys who have the nice cars, and the money, and the jewelry, and the clothes, and the power are respected in the neighborhood, and you want to be like that. And it's glorified. You know, what are the movies that are the most popular in this culture? Horror movies and crime movies. Anytime a good the crime movie comes out, it's going to be a box office smash. It's got enough explosions, you know, special effects, and strong character. Because America loves crime. America glorifies crime and criminals. The Godfather is like one of the all-time great movies in American culture. And what is it about? A family that successfully defies the structure of society and creates its own rules. And this sort of mentality is duplicated all over the country in black and urban areas. And hip hop music. I'm sure you all listen to hip hop in one form or another. Hip hop glorifies crime. It's that song. You got the nicest ride, you got the series, you got all the money, you got all the holes. I mean, that's what hip hop is about. It's about materialism, it's about excess. It used to be about being able to express a different point of view than the mainstream. But that's not commercial. Conscious rappers don't make money. 
Common doesn't make as much money as Little Wayne or Big Wheels because his message doesn't resonate with young people. He's not talking about what they want to hear. But hip hop music is one of the foundations of mass incarceration. But who talks about that? And when you do talk about that, people look at you like you've said something wrong or that you're behind the time. But if kids look at crime as a lifestyle and it's fostered by hip hop music, that is the reality. Recently there was a sheriff, um, I can't think of what town, but I just saw him on the news um, two days ago. And he was castigating the NAACP for talking about the shootings in Ferguson and, and um, the, the strangling of Eric Varner and the entire Black Lives Matter campaign. And what he said was controversial and he caught a lot of heat for it and he's going to continue to catch heat for it. But there's truth in what he said. He, he said, why are you looking at the cops as the sole source of the problem? He said, one of the major problems is single parent homes in the black community. And we're going to talk about that. Now, think about this. You have a generation of young black men being raised without fathers. Because their fathers are incarcerated, or they're on drugs, or they're not in the home. And when you are raised without the benefit of a father, there are a lot of things that you don't want if you have a good father. A good father brings structure to your life. He teaches you a, a sense of responsibility. He teaches you the value of hard work. He teaches you to respect women. He teaches you to respect yourself. He teaches you how to be a black man in America, which is totally different from what a father, what your father will teach. Your father will <coughs> teach you how to be a man if he's a good father. He's not teaching you how to be a white man, because that's not necessary. He's just teaching you to be a man. But black fathers have to teach their sons how to be black men in America. And that is a different culture, a different way of thinking, a different way of living, a different way of approaching authority, talking to the police, talking to your teachers, talking to your employers, and dealing with each other. Because there are different obstacles and barriers that we face as black men in America than everybody else does. And that's the reality. So you've got a generation of young men growing up without the benefit of that and listening to the mothers. Now, there are many, many wonderful black mothers, and they have literally raised us. My mother raised me. I had a father, but he wasn't there all the time. He was a good father in terms of providing. He always paid the bills and he provided. But he was a, a long distance truck driver, and during the week, he was on the road. And on weekends, he was out doing his thing. He was a handsome guy, you know, very good in terms of um, Get to Gap, a lot of girlfriends, different families here and there. He was a typical black father who was not attentive to the emotional needs of his family. So I grew up without a father, even though I had a father. And my father and I didn't really establish a good relationship until I became an adult. And this happens all over the black community. But in my life, I had a lot of uncles and a lot of you know, folks in the business community who were substitute fathers. And that's what is needed in the black community, substitute fathers. That's what we do in our program for, for um, children of incarcerated parents, and also in our program for at-risk youth. We try to be substitute fathers. A lot of our kids, their fathers are doing life sentences, or doing long sentences, or they just aren't there. They live in another city or another part of this part of this city, and they just aren't attentive fathers. And all of these things are part of the fact
foundation of mass incarceration. You guys have studied the history of mass incarceration as it relates to what Michelle Alexander wrote about the class system. And this is extremely valid. Coming out of slavery and coming into that era of Jim Crow, that's when mass incarceration really solidified and became a structure, a way of life in American society. So when you look at something that's embedded in the fabric of society, and you wonder how is that going to change? You guys have read The Jim Crow. This is a book that I think is equally as powerful. It's called Race, Wrong, and Remedies. It's by Amy Wex. You should write this down, and even if you don't read the book, read the synopsis of the book that are online, and start talking about it. Um, Ms. Wax has done a wonderful job in distilling a lot of things that's been said in the black community. Quite some time, but has not been adequately heard. What you have is a system of mass incarceration that is structural in nature. Discrimination, employment, housing, education, um, across the board. And those are the entrenched systems that Bob was talking about have to be dismantled. But seriously, is it going to be dismantled? Mm, who knows? And if it is, it's going to take years and years and years because it's been in place for so long. But in black America, we have some hard struggles that we can address that's apart from the system of discrimination that's in place. And these are things that we can work on in our communities ourselves, like valuing education. And that's simple things like going to bed. A lot of black homes, bedtime is when kids get tired. And that's crazy. It needs to be a bedtime so that kids can get up in the morning and be fresh for school. Homework has to be done. And find an after school program, if they don't do the homework at after school program, it doesn't get done. Because their parents don't make them do homework. Um, school attendance. So many of our kids are charged with truancy because they don't go to school. We go to family court, and the friend center, we're right across from the family court, so we go there all the time. How many times do I stand there and the judge opens the folder and she says, well, you missed uh, 72 days of school last year. How do you miss 72 days of school? That means the parents are making sure their kids go to school or kids are leaving the house and going somewhere else. Entrepreneurship. In our neighborhoods, all the businesses in our neighborhoods are run by other races. Asians, Hispanics, whites. Which means that the black dollar in our community goes from our pocket into the merchant pocket and it goes out of the community. And they aren't hiring that many of us to work in their stores. Which means that the economic life of most black communities are not controlled by the community. And that's major. When you talk about mass incarceration, one of the foundation of mass incarceration is the lack of economic opportunity in our neighborhoods. Which means that there's not jobs. Why are there no jobs? Because you don't own the businesses that could give jobs. If that's the case, how do you change that? That means that black entrepreneurs have to bring their money together and open stores, and they have to have stores that are as good or better than the stores that exist. Which means you got to open on time, you have to have quality service, treat people well, and maintain a good business. And that's been a challenge in many black communities. Home ownership. 
you look at North Philadelphia, Black North Philadelphia, as opposed to White South Philadelphia, and you see clean streets and houses painted nice and trees and bushes, that's because those folks own their home. When you own something you value, you clean your streets, you, you, you paint your house, you don't let things fall down around you. But if you, if you live in a house you're waiting for a landlord, and he's unresponsive to what you're saying, then you're like, this ain't mine, you know, I'll live here and move somewhere else. And neighborhoods deteriorate. Family structure, how people talk to each other, to each other, how they respect each other. Many times in our community, I hear kids talking to each other, and the language they use, it, it, it's like crazy. You can go online, and I have 12 grandkids and 10 God kids, and several of them are my friends on Facebook. I don't stalk the pages, you know, I don't believe it. But often I will send things I find interesting to their page, and some of their friends find me interesting. It's like, pop, pop, and said this last week, you know, and it's a different vibe, you know. So I'll go on their page to respond to something, or I'll, they're on my computer, and leave the page open, and I see it, I'm looking. Frankly, it's some dumb shit that I've never, I mean, like, why are you writing this? Don't you respect yourself? Don't you know that five years down the road, you know, an employer can, you know, check your page and, and see all this insanity that you wrote on your page, and that reflects on who you are. I have a great um, director of administration for uh, TCRC, um, Nisha Armstrong. And before she hires anybody, as a volunteer, as an intern, or as a staff person, she looks at their Facebook page. That's the first thing she does. Because that's a reflection of who you are. Not who is sitting in front of an employer with a little outfit on and hair all nice, putting forth your best impression because you want a job. No. It's that drunk person on Facebook, you know, just talking like the world's in it. It's, it's a different vibration. So what I'm saying is that in order to remedy many of the problems that is faced by our neighborhoods, by black Americans, by those most affected by mass incarceration and by social justice, we have to do this ourselves. Um, my mentor told you to say that the revolution begins within. And that's the reality. Who you are as an individual affects what goes on around you. Many times, people will say, we don't have the same leaders we had before. They killed Martin Luther King, they killed Malcolm X. Um, there's no strong leaders to lead us into the future. You know, all we have is Al Sharpton. You know, that's another story. <laughs> But the reality is there are hundreds of thousands of leaders who are leading every day by example. There are hundreds of thousands of black mothers who are putting their kids in bed early, who are cleaning their homes, who are making sure they have a education, who are working hard, working two and three jobs to ensure that their children move forward. I see black fathers all over the city. In fact, we have this little um, film that we're going to post on our website. And it's called Black Fathers in Action. And what I did is I went all over the city because I'm always hearing there's no black fathers. And as I move around the city, I see black fathers on the subway, taking their kids to school. I see them all over the city. So I took my little video camera and you know, I just walk up to people and start filming them, you know. I explain who I am, what I'm doing, and I ask them, <coughs> what do you say about a black father? And they give me like a little, you know, 60 second or two or three minute clip about how they film about a black father. Because there's a lot of black fathers out there who are really doing the work that is necessary to build our community. But we are acknowledged. You know, there are many 
returning citizens who have come home and who are not involved in crime anymore, who have a strong family, who are working every day, and who are putting in the necessary work to rebuild our community. We need to be recognized. We need to be encouraged. We need to be paid. We have a proposal with city council that would hire thousands of returning citizens to mentor in their neighborhoods. In the neighborhoods where they live, where they're respected, those of us who went to jail, did our time, never snitched and rattled on anybody, and we're respected by the kids in our neighborhood. They call us OGs, original gangsters. That's a term of respect, as it should be, because that's who we were. I was a real gangster. I mean, I mean, I look at now, you know, I've definitely mellowed out over the years. I tell my grandkids, you know, yes, you call me Pop Pop J, you know, but I wasn't always that. That's who I am now. You know, but by virtue of the years we put in, you know, by virtue of our respect in the community, we could change the face of how Philadelphia functions. We could lower the rate of violence. When you're talking about kids shooting themselves over nothing, if guys who are respected in the various neighborhoods were paid a living wage with benefits and assigned to churches, uh, rec centers, um, neighborhood organizations, and given authority to mentor kids in a certain range of where they are, they would referee disputes. They would settle beasts before that happened. They'd be able to go to if if one kid tried another kid. They know both families. They can mediate so there's not a second shooting. There's so much that could be done if the city would recognize the value of our time, our experience, our wisdom, and our standing in the community. Now they're thinking about it, but they're bureaucrats. And it, it may take a long time, you know, before they act on it. So we're trying to get faith-based organizations, uh, churches, and private corporations to fund the idea so that we can begin it. And then as we make an impact, maybe they'll get the proper funding. But that's the way they got to think. 